Now, when we're naming them, like I said, there's there's three ways we can go about this. The first way, um, we can name it by its vertex, just like I have here. So we can refer to this as angle A. Over here, um, this would be angle S. So I would, in quotations, I would say if I were to read this, or if I'm interpreting it, read, you know, kind of talking to myself, it would be angle S. That's the first way. Um, when you are simply naming it by its vertex. But unfortunately, that doesn't always work because item five, that's an isolated angle. There's no other angles around it, uh, and so it's there's no question which one you're talking about. Same thing here for number six. But what if you were to have three rays with a common endpoint? So I have ray RQ, RP, RT. Well now, you have three angles. You've got this acute angle, I'll call it one. You got this acute angle, I'll call it two. And you got the whole thing. So there's three angles within this diagram. So if I looked at this diagram and I said, hey, I want you to measure angle R, well, that's very ambiguous. Which, which one am I talking about? There's three angle R's there because there's three angles that have the same vertex uh, point R. So this first way, not that common. Um, I mean, we'll use it every now and then, but it's not that common. Number two is if you are so lucky in <clears throat> the book um, or, or your homework or my quiz or test, if you're so lucky, sometimes we will put numbers in the interior of the angle, like I have done previous, uh, you know, before I started this video, in orange ink. I just added those numbers. There's no significance to three. There's no significance to seven. It's just any number um, you can put in there, and, and you can refer to it as such. So, from what I came up with, we could also call number five. We could call that angle because that is the number that I chose to put in there. And then we would call item 6, we could call that, because there's a 7 in the interior, you could call it angle 7. And the last way uh, that we can name angles, which is by far the most popular, and by far the one that we're going to use the most in this class, and that is the three-letter process three letters. So if you look at item six, there's three points that make up that, um, make up that angle. And we're going to use these three points to name it. So another appropriate name for item six, yes, we could call it angle S because that's the vertex. Yes, we could call it angle seven because there's a seven in the interior. But we could also call it angle RST. Or we can call it angle T S R. Now notice for both names, I kept S in the center. And that is absolutely crucial because that is the vertex. Whenever you use the three letter process, the vertex must be the middle number. So in orange, I'm writing important vertex must be the middle number. Sorry, I keep saying number. It's a letter. Oh, it's been a long day. I apologize. Okay, <clears throat> so angle R, S, T. S is in the center because that is the vertex. But we could also reverse those and say angle T, S, R, S. That letter is still in the middle, in the middle because that is the vertex. We're going to be using that method the most. So <clears throat> rather than having to write angle S or angle seven or angle RST is there a shorthand notation and there absolutely is you're gonna use your symbol that we talked about over here and then just write either the letter number or the three letters so you would write for this angle A again if you write it as you say it's much easier this one would be angle three this here would be angle S this is angle seven um, down here <clears throat> this is angle R S T over here is angle R ooh 
angle T S R. All righty. <clears throat> so, we first talk, talked about a point, and that had zero dimensions. And then we said, well, what if we have two points? Then we can draw a line through it. Um, and so once you do that, once you have two points and you have a line or a piece of a line, um, <clears throat> you have to understand that these are one-dimensional objects. They have some sort of length. And now we get into item seven, this geometric figure. This is a plane, and this is a two-dimensional figure. So over to the right, I'm going to go ahead and write the definition. Uh, a plane is a flat two-dimensional surface is a flat two-dimensional surface. Um, planes are, are it's kind of a tricky thing to talk about and, and, and to grasp because planes they don't have a thickness um, and, and this, this, so if you were to think about a sheet of metal um, that extends forever and ever in, in two directions, um, that, that length and that width, um, in those two dimensions, it ex, ex, uh, expands and goes and goes and goes and forever, and then somehow it stays perfectly rigid, perfectly flat, but then it doesn't have a thickness. Um, it's, it's just a crazy thing to think about, but it's just representing some, um, some flat surface. Uh, like a wall or like a floor, um, those kind of things. So <clears throat> there's two ways that we can name a plane. Well, so first let's talk about this symbol. The symbol for a plane, you can see that it's represented by this quadrilateral. This it almost looks like a parallelogram. Um, so the symbol is is exactly that, but a mini one of those. And so that, when you see or read that, that you should say plane. So <clears throat> the two ways that we can name play, planes is using this symbol. So start off with a symbol for plane, followed by any three non-collinear points in the plane. And it can be in any order as well. So those three non-collinear points can be written in any order. As long as they're not on the same line and they're all in the plane, that would be appropriate way to name it. So to give you an example, I could say, so in quotations I would say, hey, this is plane J T N. Or I could say, hey, this is plain P N K. Those are appropriate names for this, and that's what you would say. But I don't want to be writing P L A N E every single time. So what we would write is plain, that's the parallelogram little symbol for it, and then capital print letters J T N. And then this one would be plain. P N K. The second way that we can <clears throat> label or name planes is sometimes you're lucky and you'll get a capital script letter in one of the corners of the planes. Now, if you originally looked at this diagram and thought that X was a point, um, the fact that it's in cursive and a script kind of like a loopy way of, of writing that letter. That should throw up some red flags. You know that that's not a point because it's a point's got to be a capital print letter. Also, there's no dot next to that cap. If you look at the diagram here with this plane, you'll notice that there is this capital script or cursive, I mean the same thing. Uh, you'll see this cursive capital letter there. Um, this is not a point because a, it's in cursive, and we know that points need to be capital print letters. We also know uh, that it's not a point because there's, there's no dot next to it. Um, so sometimes in certain diagrams, they will give you a capital 
cursive or script letter in one of the corners. So this is the second way that we name planes by using the capital script letter in the corner. So when we use that, we would say plane X, and then we would write the notation, put the symbol, and then X. Now I feel that it's more appropriate to write out the word plane when you uh, use that capital letter, but I won't count if you use the symbol. I won't count that incorrect, but I prefer that you just write out when you're using the capital script letter and describing the plane. So um, that is a lot, but as you can see, there is so much information and every single bit of this is extremely, extremely important. So um, please re-listen to this video um, <clears throat> and understand how to appropriately identify, describe, and name um, all these different geometric figures. If we turn to the next page, page two, we have this chart. Now, <clears throat> in class, um, some of you are upset because we spent so much time going over exactly what this chart says, but uh, I think it's good to, for you to hear it uh, and then for you to write it down and for you to practice um, writing all of those different symbols and notations, so on and so forth. Take note of this over here. Um, it says reading math. So as we're reading and as we're um, just kind of interpreting these sentences, if you see this symbol with the two arrowheads, that means line A, B, and so it's read exactly like that. Just as it's just said I did on the other side in purple ink. So this is what you say, but this is what you write, or that's what you will see on the paper. So it does that with line segments and also rays. So again, <clears throat> this, this table here says, <clears throat> excuse me, this table here has everything that, um, that I said, um, plus one thing that I do want to add is we talked about how you name a line that's with at least two points on that line in any order. So for this, they have line AB and they'll have BA. Those are appropriate names. Sometimes you'll get this lowercase cursive letter um, that's near the line, and that's an appropriate way to name it. And when you write it out, you have to write out the word line and then that lowercase letter. So this is line M. Do not ever put that, l that's that lowercase script letter and then put a line over it. I don't ever want to see that. That is wrong. If you're going to use the lowercase letter, use the you need to write out the word line and then follow it by whatever lowercase letter it is. Here's talking about segment and then ray and plane. So item eight, <clears throat> we do this together in class. Is identify each geometric figure. So item A, this here, this geometric figure is a line.